Hello, everybody. Welcome into Debate Night. We are back once again with another episode. Um, got a great show today, some interesting things to talk about, and some great guest analysts as well. Um, Brody is here, still hanging on to the beard. It's still going strong. Kelsey, before she left, she left today, she literally looked at me and says, do not shave that off. So, wow. Um, okay. Yeah, I need to trim it because you know me, yeah. I'm lazy. So I don't like to trim because yeah. you actually have to try it's easier to just shave the whole thing. Yeah. Just take it all off. And then, you know, I only have to do it, you know, once every couple of months. So, uh, there you have it. But yeah, the beard is in form. Man of the people is back in Dallas, uh, travel day yesterday. And then today has been honestly kind of crazy, uh, because Kelsey was leaving today. So try to spend as much time with her as well as kind of get a bunch of other stuff done. Uh, that being said though, Still got to read the top comment in the last video. And here's the thing. I read it good, bad, ugly, sad, whatever it is, I read it. And it just so happens this week from A. Hildy 1966 with 60 upvotes. Brody, I will admit I wasn't a fan of yours at first. I mean, who is this guy with all these social media followers coming into my sacred sport and thinking he is going to take it over? But you have grown on me and debate night and your podcast with your no holds bar opinions makes things dot dot dot. Wait, why is it not saying the whole thing? Oh, here we go. Makes things interesting. It would be boring without you and I wouldn't watch. So screw the detractors and keep doing you. It is good for the sport. Kudos, brother. Did you write that? Uh, <laughs> that is not my dog in the profile photo. <laughs> okay. Wow. Kind words. Name I don't think people. I've ever written kudos either in my life. So. <laughs> That's not one. I don't know that I've ever typed that out either. Kudos. Not, not one. Not one in my vocabulary. Did you guys ever have kudos bars? Did, were those around? Yeah, those are really good. No, yeah. The chocolate. Granola I know I'm thing. asking you guys. I'm the youngest. So I yeah, guess you like. Think, <laughs> those are like Nutrigrain bars. You think you're actually having like a healthy snack. And it's <laughs> no. really not healthy <laughs> yeah, at all. It's just bars. a candy bar. Yeah, yeah. They, were, they were legit candy. Um, speaking <laughs> of eye candy, Hunter's here as well. Bum After angle. going into the blue eyes, yeah, you know, if I if I have a rough <laughs> show tonight, I'm sorry. Uh, I I am sitting on a sprained ankle here, barely can can barely uh, stand it. Got bruising all over. I would show you, but you got to pay for that. Um, so <laughs> you know, it's it, it's impeding my mental abilities. But you know, I'm here. We'll just see what happens. Yeah, it was a pretty sick sprain. It was a really good one. Don't Jump ask putts how are I dangerous. did it. Nope. Don't ask oh. how I did it. <laughs> um, and then. What? Yeah. I was celebrating a win. Brody's on to me. I won an elite <laughs> series. Went down the slip and slide. Got too crazy. <laughs> um, speaking of that elite series, Gary is here and he was at the at elite series, um, ready to bring his knowledge to this episode. Yeah. You know, I got to thank uh, a subset of people. There were a, a ton of people out there who were like, cheering on debate night um left right and center running to people wow. they're like yo i think i know you um but the the hottest one for me was when i walked up to, to ab and gannon during the play with the champs and ab looks at me before i get standing and says you're on debate night and he puts his fist no, out no he me. did not he did he absolutely did again and said he's the one with <laughs> the eyes and i'm like oh man <laughs> that that so, his life. oh my so, god uh, if you're watching anthony so <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Gannon, thank you, you for me? the heart palpitations. I appreciate it. <laughs> Holy cow. We were talking about you uh, a little bit on Sunday, Trevor. What did you say? Uh, his <laughs> well, his, Some of his buddies were there because I think that tournament, uh, one of his friends lives there, so a lot of them fly wow. back for that tournament. And uh, someone was like, so is Trevor going to caddy for you at Worlds? He's like, yeah, I think so one day. So you better get training. Go, Trev. Speaking Locked of chatting, too. Gosh, my... Best round of the week. Gary was on the bag. Just saying. Oh, yeah. And we knew yep. that. And we knew that. Brody. I, Brody. I can't even tell you how much more energy I have towards this show, knowing that Anthony Barella might be watching it. <laughs> Just might be. That that That's crazy. Uh, good for in, you, though. Gary. Good for you. How was he looking? Nah, I'm just kidding. Uh, Sam, <laughs> Sam, you're uh, also joining us. Longtime veteran of the show. How many times have you gotten recognized as a debate night contestant yet? Uh, that has not happened yet. Um, I did Somebody just recognize to, Sam. I did just move to a new city, so there's a chance. I haven't gotten out to any leagues yet. Okay. Um, but if anybody is in the Florida Panhandle near Panama Ooh. City Beach, hit me up. Um, I'd love to play some disc golf with you. 
Go Gators. Did you guys see uh, off topic? Did you see Pitbull bought the like stuff? Definitely the rights not Go Florida? Gators. That's not Go Gators territory. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's Go Gators wherever you are if you're yeah. a real fan. Now you're in the Panhandle. I grew up right in Pennsylvania. Now, and it, was, it was Go Gators. So what are you gonna say about that? <laughs> Literally right now, Florida State. Let's go Tebow in Pennsylvania. Um, yeah. No. Did you see? Uh, there's a there, Pitbull Stadium in yeah, Florida, yeah. Florida International. Yeah. There's yeah. stadium rights. I think people got to start doing that. What's the worldwide? Yeah. We're, we're Foundation Stadium. What are we gonna buy? Maybe you can buy a pickleball court. Pickleball arena or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be a, fitting. A slip and slide. Uh, yeah. Factory. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a shout out slip and slides. <laughs> um, all uh, right. Apparently that's trademark too, by the way. So just, you know. Ooh. Shout just, out slippery I, tarps. My, my, I'm saying slipping S L E P P E N slide. Yeah, you're fine. Slip yeah, it depends slide. on how you spell yeah. it. That's I pronounce fair. it weird. All right. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, all right. We're going to get into it with a hot topic here. This is probably one of the spicier topics that has uh, arisen on social media. I started up, but I didn't try to. Um, some would say I did. I didn't. Uh, this is the question. It's very simple. Is Gannon's season greater than Paul McBeth's 2015 season? If so, why? If not, what would he need to do to eclipse it? Very simple question. People are getting all riled up about it. Brody, lead it off for us. Yeah, I mean, I think you guys kind of already answered this. If people have listened to Grip Locked, I think you did a pretty good job of laying down the the, the groundwork of why this is the case. Uh, so I'm not going to rehash all the, the statistics that you threw out, which was actually pretty impressive there, Trevor. Um, but I, I, it's, I mean, again, I, I think the best argument, and this is something that you said, Trevor, the best argument is we're not in different eras here. This isn't us trying to figure out is Gannon Burr better than Ken Climo? And it's like, well, Ken Climo is using different discs. Uh, They're putting in different baskets. The courses were drastically different. Uh, Everyone on tour still had full-time jobs. Like that is a massive gap between those two eras. And that would be difficult. Paul is still playing. And the person that he was battling with is actually the best they've ever been. Ricky Wysocki, who's roughly, roughly around the same age. So it's like, it's a, it's kind of a no brainer situation here of where disc golf has gotten a lot harder to, to place well, to win, to cash. I mean, it was a crazy, like looking at the type of people that had crazy cash streaks, Kayla Visca, Nate Sexton, all these people that guaranteed cash, guaranteed cash. And all of a sudden, what, they're just bad now? And that's why they're missing cash? No, the field's way harder. It's way harder to do it now. And Gannon's doing it at the top highest level. All right. Maybe that's the truth people don't want to hear. Hunter, what do you think? Uh, is Gannon's season greater than Paul's 2015 season right now? No. Like, we're halfway through this season right now. Uh, there's still two majors left to play. There's just too much golf left. I think what made Paul's season so impressive was the consistency and the ability to do it for the entire year. If you're not familiar with his 2015 season, he won 20 times. He lost six times. He never finished outside the top three, only came in third twice with one of those being a one round major warm up event at the beginning of the season that probably shouldn't even count if we're being completely honest, because it was literally one round. Um, but Regardless, obviously the big concern here is field strength. So if we're looking season for season, field strength for field strength, um, we can actually look deeper into this. Stat Mando lets us go back. So we can actually look at, use the same Stat Mando stats for field strength to 2015 and compare it to field strength to 2024. USDGC in 2015 would have been the highest strength of field. Comes in 0.2 behind this year's highest strength of field, which is Waco. For more statistics here, Gannon won Waco by one. Paul won USCGC that year by five. Ledgestone comes in sixth overall on this list back in 2015. Memorial at seventh overall, both of which tie or beat this year's European Open, Champions Cup, Music City, Portland Open, Beaver State, Fling, etc. Worlds is also at 15th from that year. Maple Hill at 16th, Beaver State at 17th. All of those are ahead of OTB, the Preserve, Des Moines, etc. Long story short, the field was definitely weaker back then. There's not an argument there, but let's not act like the field was non-existent back then because if it was, and you want to use that argument, then we can use the same stat Mando stats to say that Gannon's field that he's beating is also irrelevant because it's way behind a lot of what these uh, stats are. So in order for Gannon to eclipse Paul's year, he needs to lend at least one more major and maintain his average finishing place inside the top five, in my opinion. I'm going to go over on time here, but 
That would secure him with six total wins, two majors, average finish place in the top five, which in this year's field, I think that's a pretty solid argument for the greatest season of all time. But right now, just too early. So here's my question. Do you know how stat Mando calculates? Yeah. What the because heck? I'm pretty sure they have to be calculating it relative to the actual yeah. field. <laughs> because yeah. no, they don't what compare. The they don't compare <laughs> season to season like that. Ever, Hunter. <laughs> yeah. I didn't come up with a stat. That, that unfortunately <laughs> that, that entire argument just can't yeah. be true. <laughs> thank you, Trevor. You still have a rebuttal, you. but thank you. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> like I, it, it, that strength, the field number you're getting is for 2015's field. Like how strong was it compared to 2015's field? But then wouldn't the best one be a hundred because what I, well here's what i know what i know is that would be the strongest the, field that year the world's field th this is the stat that i found the world's field had 55 players a thousand rated or yeah. better whereas this year it was like it was like a hundred and something like yeah, that, world's that, world's is way down there it was like 15th or 16th it was it was comparing to like otb and preserve and portland which no one travels to now so that but logically how, makes how, sense to me but how like is the it most how, one of the best attended events in 2015 Hunter, how compared is, to one of the worst attended but you events said, in so you said usddc was close to waco in strength of field that to me just that, it was close that it can't makes sense be because usdgc true. usdgc this year will be the strongest field because it's invite only really hard to get into only the best players in the world making the bottom of the field non-existent making the overall field very strong so that should always be the number one field right but what i want to know what metric it's using because it I can't be rating because I would imagine it's basing it also off of the bottom of the field, which at Waco was yes, also going to be pretty that, weak compared to saying. USDGC. Strokes that's gained, fair. strokes gained is a terrible statistic because it takes it, it takes the whole field into account, and so you might have eighty of the top players in the world there, but you also have forty of people that do not belong on tour at all, and so it inflates strokes gained crazy. Uh, the point I was just trying to make is we can't just say that Paul was beating up nobody back then. Because he was. No, he was beating a couple people. Yeah, yeah, there was a couple. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. That just made it seem really old. bad all year long. That's better than someone beating a couple people barely half a year. Yeah, I. I would. I but you're saying Gannon's beating a couple people now? I'm just saying, like Gannon's halfway into the year beating a lot of people. He could go 50th average place the rest of the year, and no one would call that the greatest season of all time. It's too early. That's my whole argument. All right, I'm, I'm not going to dock you too heavily because I don't know how that stats completely made but like i just yeah i don't know i i want to know how that works <laughs> yeah um sam what are weigh in on this what are your thoughts i think you could go back and forth like you just did on this topic for a while and make a lot of different arguments about paul not playing anybody the field being so much stronger now blah 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 i get it but when i pull up the pdga website and i use our horrible search engine to find eventually find paul mcbeth's page and I click on the 2015 tab, I see 26 rows of things. 20 of them have a little one next to them, and the others have a two or a three next to them. When I click on Gannon Burr season for this year, that's not what I see, plain and simple. Paul McBeth in 2015 was playing the best of the best disc golfers that were available for him to play against at the time. And guess what? He beat them consistently, very consistently. Gannon Burr, I'm not dissing his season this year whatsoever. Gannon has done, had an incredible season. He's playing against a very hard field, and he's winning pretty well, and he's placing super high at every event. But when you're comparing the two, I just don't, I don't feel confident in putting Gannon's season that doesn't have as many wins, doesn't has more worse finishes than Paul's 2015 season. I just, in my book, you can't put that ahead. Hey, fair enough. I mean, there's always, there's always going to be that, that dominance there. And, and that, you know, it speaks for itself. Uh, Gary, you've had to listen to all this now. So what are, what are your thoughts? Where do you sit in this argument? Yeah. I think the big thing you have to do is separate in your mind, the idea that we're, we're talking about um, comparing seasons and not comparing the players. It isn't a question of who would win on a neutral location. It's about which season is greater. And, and we've heard a lot of the stats, you know, at this point in the 2015 season, Paul had seven wins. I'm only talking about tour and major wins only. And Gannon has five. We can't talk about money because that's the payouts are different. So that's just not a good argument to have here. Worst finish for Paul was third by this point for Gannon. It's 13th, but the strength of field is the argument that we have to go through because Paul's contemporaries back then were Ricky an old Doss, kind of Felberg, kind of Schusterick, Sexton, and a young Lazat, and a, few, a handful of other people, obviously. Gannon's contemporaries are, you know, Ricky, Calvin, AB, Lazat, kind of Eagle, the Robinson brothers, Antela, Old Macbeth, Klein. Like, 
it's harder to win now than it was nine years ago. Like it's been said a hundred times here, players aren't getting worse. It's the field is just getting better. I'm not a hundred percent ready to say that Gannon's having a better season than Paul because majors mean something. I think if Gannon takes down worlds, we've got a discussion that we have to have. If he then wins us DGC, I think it's a done deal. As long as he stays consistent the rest of the year, I don't care about the president cup loss because the Scandinavian and Aussie open are just nothing burgers compared to champions cup this year. Um, but I think Gannon's showing us that the only, only way to beat him requires him to beat himself. And the crazy part is he's getting better while his body continues to develop. Um, I don't even think we've seen the best game yet out of Gannon. So he's already on a historic season run. Let's just see if, if he can finish it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a very interesting argument. I think the, probably the best argument for Paul's season, nobody will deny that Ricky was playing at an unbelievable level. Still back then he was a very good player and Paul, I mean, what, what, what was his his record that year was like, what, 18 and six or something like it was something cr- like ju- he, he no matter what, he had to beat Ricky every single time. And he he did like more beat often Ricky than not. By, I believe it was like 40 some strokes across the majors and NT events that year. Right. So, you know, that Can I throw the, a rebuttal out. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to clarify one more thing, because I think okay. this is getting overlooked. The biggest reason that Gannon season as of right now is not better than Paul's season is it's August and we have Worlds and USDGC. Yeah. I finished my statement saying in order for Gannon to do that, he needs to maintain his average finishing place and pick up at least one more major or a few more pro tours. So like he's yeah. not out of the race yet. It's just we're having this discussion on beginning of August. Like the dude yeah, could I literally thought, I thought average it was more of a hypo- I thought it was more of a hypothetical of question versus right now. If Mm -hmm. Gannon got his arms chopped off and his season was over, I thought it was more hypothetical of like the way that Gannon's playing right now. Is he going to have the best season ever? Yeah. I Um, I don't think, I don't think many people would argue it. So the, the two, the two rebuttals I have is the first one is like, you have to Sam, you have to look at what people are playing in. You just have to do that. Like, I don't think anyone is going to argue the skill level of players and athletes in the sixties versus now. Like we're not taking away anything from people that were doing great stuff in the sixties and seventies, but athletes are way better now than they were back then. So you do have to look at what, and also you got like, there are so many people now that the money is available that we're having 16, 17, 18 year olds come out on tour now. Cause they can, uh, you were having back then you were just having people that, Oh, the, the, there's a tournament in town. I'm going to show up to that tournament. And the last thing I would just say too. And this kind of just proves my point too, of where like the bottom of the field, the strength of field and all this stuff, I don't really understand any of it, but Thursday for Saturday and Sunday played pretty much identical at Ledgestone. The the temperatures were the same. It was about the same wind. There was nothing different about it. I shot three under on Saturday, 10, 22 rated. I thought I shot four under on Sunday any guesses of what the rating was? One shot better. Uh, same, same exact conditions. It, the course did not play any harder. Ten thirty-one. Nope, it was ten fifteen. You know why? Because there was a cut, and they cut all the people that made the course look a lot harder than it actually was. Drop my mic. Rating suck. Next question. I, oh. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I don't really know. What we're talking no, that was about just I, I had to go after the ratings a little bit. <laughs> I, just, I do want to point out. I do want to point out the 2015 field again, because people trash on it and trash on that era as if there was only like two people. This is the world's field. There was Paul, Ricky, Nate Doss. He was old. That's fair. Will Shustrick, pretty much in his prime. This is pre-injury. Will Shustrick. This is like he was one of the greatest players in the world in 2012. This is three years after that. Nico LaCastro, Nate Sexton, Steve Rico, again, younger Steve Rico, Simon Lazat, Jeremy Colin, Kayla Visca, Greg Barsby, Paul Ulibarri. A whole bunch James of guys Proctor, that didn't win squad. Yeah, but, but, whole bunch of guys that didn't win squad. Hunter, Hunter, Hunter all those people, Eagle all those McMahon, Zach all those Melton. Pe- yeah, but I all mean, those people are just like Melton. What are we talking about? Hunter, just, all those people are, recognize. I'll just all go. Those, all you all those people you're listing right Calvin now. Heimberg. There, there are like 50 to 60 of those guys now on tour. All I'm those just guys saying. There's yeah, like the people you a lot of the people that Gary listed is like this is who Gannon has to go through now. Paul beat him at Worlds in 2015. Obviously, they, that was uh, nine years ago. Yeah, but I'm exactly. just saying. 
but, but yeah. I, I, I last year, buddy, Calvin last, has gone through puberty yet. Last, last rebuttal I have is I was talking to Ezra, and after Gannon's round, I think it was round two, I think, is when he got a huge lead. And I was saying, I was like, Ezra, you need to make sure, like, when you pop off, you have to do it at tournaments that Ricky's not popping off, that Gannon's not popping off, and AB's not popping off. He's like, yeah, I know. I had the best tournament of my life, and I finished third at Texas States. You throw Ezra back into that era, he probably wins a couple times. He probably does. We'll never but know. It's, it's so hard. We never know. But I'm saying <laughs> it's so hard now because there is going to be one, two, or three guys that have an incredible – I mean, think about it. Where, where, did, where was Cole this year at Ledgestone? Defending champion. What happened? Was there an know. FPO playoff? He didn't. He didn't. <laughs> he didn't pop off. He didn't pop off. Someone yeah. else did. It's, it's just. It's so hard to win. Is all I'm saying. It's so yeah. hard. I, know, yeah, I would I never. Just, yeah, I would never argue come against after the 2015 field. A lot of times they just say he just had to beat Ricky, and it's like. Uh, I mean, that's kind that, of well. Who he to had be to fair, beat, that though, was Hunter. a lot of the tournaments. But they then you can just two. you can say that too of of well, no. Gannon just has to beat Ricky what? and Calvin this year. No, like they, Nick, He has to beat Nicholas. He has to beat A B. He has to beat. Then I can go. Then Paul had to beat. Will Shoestrick, he had to beat Simon Lazard. But he had we're to just beat, saying like, that Ricky that. and Paul went I one, two a lot. Just because I say it but, in that, but, but, no, no, but, no, no, that, that's very but different. Paul and Ricky Hunter. went one, I two all the time. You know I agree different. the field's deeper. I'm just saying Paul didn't only have to beat Ricky. That's all I'm saying. I, I would just say there's a lot of tournaments where Paul and Rick went one, two, and they separated themselves quite a bit. They but were clearly easiest, the best players in the world. Hunter, being clearly the, easiest, the best player in the world doesn't mean you're the only player in the field. And there's the only other thing I want to re- – re- re- last rebuttal. I know I had 5,000, but Sam saying I looked at Paul's thing and like, oh, I see first, 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 and then you can look at other things, third, third, third. Nowadays, if you play like not great, you don't finish third anymore. You finish outside the top 20. And sometimes you don't even cash and like literally mm-hmm. talk to the people on tour guys. Stop. Stop. just like speculating. Literally talk to the people on tour that have played in 2015 and have played now. And they will tell you, I'm not playing bad. I'm not guys. I'm missing catch. I'm not terrible. It's literally just, I get, I lose one stroke here or one stroke there. And I drop 30 spots. That wasn't the case back then. Bro. Yeah, I play. hear that. I hear that. And I, and I acknowledge that in my argument. Um, I think, where I, I think, and I think that we agree on that. The the reason I made the argument that I did is because the way the question was worded, it's not who had the harder season to get to where they've gotten. It's who had the greater season. Period. Yeah, it's not a. It's not going a. Up harder my statistical analysis. I look at a spreadsheet. I see ones for one person. I don't see as many ones for another person. I can assume one was greater than the I other. Did, I, I did. Know. You the, probably you probably think Emerson Keith then it has had the greatest season of all time when he won like great. when he won like forty tournaments. That's pretty great. Yeah, that would Somebody be a needs to throw that. No, 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 that. That's, the that's the greatest that tournament. Great. Great. That's the greatest tournament. That's the greatest Russell season Rings of all time. Emerson one because thing, the, one thing because to the point ones perceiving other numbers. One yeah, thing to point out: the most ones. Next is you can uh, you can agree that the 2024 field is really deep and really hard to win in, and disagree that Paul only had to beat Ricky, both because like both are true. Yeah, I don't I don't think the statement he only had to beat Ricky is true. I do think that a lot yeah, of the tournaments that other... just gets said a lot. I think I think uh, that my biggest argument is not not it doesn't have anything to do with the top end of the field. It's yeah, it's it's the it's the middle to bottom really, um, or I guess the size of the top end of the field. But yeah, there's a reason I use the the ambiguous language of greater rather than harder. Also, or Paul like is still really good now. Like that's the other thing is he's he's still very good and he's not winning. People like make it seem like Paul's trash. He's I think that would be very if you good. Watch 2015 Paul. 2015 Paul was better than modern day Paul. Let's go. Let's go. When I come up there, Hunter, let's sit down and watch. All right. Let's do it. 2015 say, Paul is one of the greatest putters that's ever existed. Yeah, I, I would say the biggest. Watch. I would say that they can throw at a very similar level. It's the putting that that, yeah. that that's pretty. He undeniable. didn't miss. Like he just painted the pole from like 50 I, I, feet. Hey, if if it if it happens, I will be the first to say I was wrong. All I'm saying is there is a lot of nostalgia, and we think that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is an awesome movie, and then you haven't watched it in Whoa. 10 years, and you go. You watch it and you that think was you're such saying, an unnecessary stretch. Come on. Yikes. <laughs> Come on. Not great costumes. Vanilla ice. 
<laughs> Who's in the movie? Ninja rap. <laughs> Come on. Just say. Hunter, that'll be a fun. Let's, let's do it. Let's, yeah, let's sit I'm down always down to watch some 2015 coverage. We'll let's sit down and watch it. some coverage. That'll <laughs> yeah. be fun. All right. Well, let's get away from that topic because we could spend an entire episode on it. Um, next question. We're going to move away from that. Um, so we just had Ledgestone just take place four rounds at Eureka Temp, um, obviously omitting Northwood Black. Uh, so my question is, would you rather... Uh, would you have rather seen Northwood Black at Ledgestone, even though it was already played four times at Champions Cup? Are you ever okay with courses being repeated on the schedule, or is this the only exception that you would prefer if you would? Um, Hunter, what do you think? Yeah, I think this is a tough one for me because I, I fully get the logic from removing it from the event. Like, I understand we played it four rounds. We're going to Ledgestone. Let's not play it again. But the side problem with that is it made Ledgestone worse. Uh, it just it just made it a worse tournament. So to me, I think an exception could have been made here only because of the circumstances around why Champions Cup even went to Northwood in the first place. Because um, in in my opinion, I think that what could have been an easy solution here is maybe just have FPO and MPO play Northwood one of the four ter- rounds, so it at least is a somewhat of a break, and we're not just seeing all four rounds at at Lake Eureka because. In general, I don't think courses, if a course has happens at an event, it shouldn't be used again at a later event. But with Champions Cup having to pivot away from WR Jackson and choosing Northwoods, I feel like an exception could have been made this year. And it would have, in my opinion, made Ledgestone better. Because would those two rounds at Northwood maybe have been boring? Sure, but were the two rounds extra that we got at Lake Eureka somewhat boring as a viewer just to watch that course over and over? Also kind of true. So I think it was kind of a lose-lose situation all around, but I would have been fine with it here. I do agree with the general sentiment, though, of like, if we use a course in this tournament, let's not use it in this tournament later in the year. I think that's a good rule. Just probably could have had an exception this year with the circumstances. Yeah, definitely um, more of a unique situation than than probably usual. Um, Sam, what do you think? Did you think they should have repeated it? Um, yes, I pretty much totally agree with Hunter. Um, I think that... Playing Northwood again would have made this tournament head and shoulders better. I mean, uh, four rounds at Lake Eureka is boring to watch. You know, it, it, uh, I won't get into all of the details, but it's just not its not what it could be. It's not the product that fans want when they watch the Pro Tour. I think that playing Northwoods multiple times is a fine situation. I, Northwoods is the hardest disc golf course on the pro tour it always produces exciting rounds where tr- where players are having a hard time navigating the course it is exciting disc golf to watch because it's not something we see week in and week out with players absolutely shredding a course you know we had a four round major that the winning score was what 16 under an average of four down per round that's pretty unheard of of on the disc golf pro tour. So I think you can play it more than once in a season. I don't have any problem with that where I would limit it is, you know, nobody wants to see the Jonesboro open the disc side of heaven multiple times in a year. There's no reason to do that. Um, I think that there are some of the bigger courses, some of the more notable courses, more fan favorite courses, like let's say um, Maple Hill or Glendivere. Those could be played more times a year. And I don't think anybody would bat an eye I don't think it is necessarily the best option, but if there's if it's going to improve a tournament, I don't see why you wouldn't do that. Yeah, it definitely could be sort of a you know case by case basis. Gary, what do you think about repeating courses on the tour? I think we have to look at this from two different perspectives. Uh, first, there's like the fan perspective because obviously, as a viewer, you know I want there to be different courses. Eureka Temp is cool and all, and I really loved playing it this past week. But Northwood is a great like counterbalance for the pros. And the B pins were slightly helpful, but I don't think it was enough. And uh, despite terrible drop zones, um, but maybe you know three rounds could have been the way to go to make this better. That being said, I know we keep talking about Eureka Temp, but this pain was felt even more, I think, at the FPO side than MPO because Sunset Hills is a fun course, but man, four rounds of watching that felt super monotonous. I think adding Northwood in there would have really have broken that up for them. And I'm a firm believer that they could have actually gone over and used the long layout at Wildlife Prairie Park, which is a 9,000-foot wooded course with really great water carries, elevation changes, and good shot variety. So they had a 
chance there. But from the DGPT perspective, I can understand the rule being created to prevent the events from going back to the same place, like everyone said. I mean, watching six rounds at Emporia a few years ago was really boring. Um, I, but I'm not sure I feel the same way about Northwood Black. I feel like I want to make an exception here because of how great the course is. The more surprising thing for me is that with only one course to manage at the MPO level, they still had spectators walking where they shouldn't have been. People were fishing on hole two's fairway during play. T signs were wrong. There were inconsistent OB markings. People weren't checking the VIP tickets. And some of the places didn't have spotters. When Brody and I got to hole 18 in round one, the spotter was just gone. Like he just vanished. Um, so if you're going to run a one course event, that stuff's got to be pristine. So either get better with the one course or let them repeat Northwood. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely think they'd have a, uh have it locked down if they're only on one property. Brody, how did a North, how did a trip to Northwood sound to you? Well, insider info, uh, the spotter on hole 18, his ride was actually the spotter on hole 17. So uh. with that guy, he was trying to get out of there. So they had a, they had a said, see ya. Um, so here, awesome. here's, a, here's a good question. Uh, why don't we just play like, you know, there's only a couple good, good courses, right? If we, if we really want to talk about, it, there's only a couple good, good courses. So why don't we just keep playing those on loop? And I think the reason that we don't is simply just because you can't like, you can't kind of keep going back to the well, to the same people week after week and getting the same spectators to pay money to come out. Maybe you can, I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe that is something to look into. That would be my only guess. Like, uh, and I, I actually, I'm not, I'm not opposed to it. I would much rather go back. You know, if let's say we play Maple Hill in the beginning of the season and Maple Hill in the end of the season, I'd much rather do that than go somewhere where the course sucks and no one likes it. The spectators hate it. No one likes watching it. Like, let's just, we don't have a lot of good courses right now. So maybe we have to wait for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, this tournament, let's be real. This tournament was a completely different test for the players um then in years past uh there was only one day day one was the only day that was actually somewhat windy that caused some issues uh other than that it was like perfect conditions so scoring was great out there and uh yeah just it was one normally a test of like four rounds two in the open two in the woods very very difficult and this year kind of felt a little bit on the uh kind of more chill side i guess you can say yeah i i think like it makes sense from the player perspective to like, of course, like if I were on the tour and I liked a handful of courses, I also wouldn't mind rotating them more. I definitely think it's a very tricky line with the, with the, those watching because you can hit fatigue really quick on a course. If you have to see it too many times, that being said, people watch our YouTube channel and we play the same five courses on repeat every single week. So one, one thing Brody brought up, like going back to the same well as spectators, I saw a lot of posts. I was on the ground, but from posting, it seemed like spectator was pretty, like was pretty light at Ledgestone this year compared to hmm. years past. I'm well, wondering if playing. that was because champions cup was there earlier. Well, everyone was playing too. Yeah. Well, that, that's always true though. There was it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ledgestone always they has always a massive event. I, yeah. but I, think, way, right? I think this year might have been bigger than normal. Like they had like 2,600 people playing. It, it was it was bigger this year. I'll tell you that normally um, every year I've gone to Ledgestone, this is my third year, I typically go out to spectate after my last round. But with the heat and everything this year, it was very we, hot. We, we were so tapped out. We're just like, you know what? We're going to go back, turn on live. Because we yeah. had a long drive tomorrow, so I wonder if that was a factor a little bit as well. It, it was, it was uncomfortably hot. If you were, because like I said, there was no wind the last two rounds. So if you were just standing there, you were. Mm -hmm. And also, I don't know if we're going to get into it, but they made really dumb decisions with the pacing of the tournament, which made it not good at all to watch mm -hmm. as a spectator. Too much. Also, if you play. have two major gaps, two pro tour stops in the same city. And one has an AM side and the other one doesn't. Obviously, the one without the AM side is going to have more spectators out of it, especially since it was a major in this case. Not if it's well, an Emporia. It's, yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a tricky one because the AM side one will give you people from out of town yeah. that wouldn't be in town. But I mean, you're right. When in, if there was 2,600 people playing Ledgestone in the AMs, and for one reason or another, a lot of them, you know, that's a huge part of your disc golf population mm -hmm. around town. So yeah. if it is too hot outside and they don't want to stick around you kind of lose them all, you know, so there, there is kind of a, a weird um, back and forth there. 
Especially because um, they offered the AM tickets for all players at a discount. So like, yeah, we were able to get cheaper tickets to to spectate. Um, although they made they made us pay spectator costs to to caddy, which was like one of the weirdest things I've seen. Well, you had to pay to caddy? I yeah, I I reached out to uh, on the disc golf scene what? page and said, hey, I'm caddy and for one of the MPO players tomorrow, do I need a ticket? And they said, yeah, you still have to buy a spectator's ticket. Oh, that. shoot me a shoot no. me a Venmo request. No, 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 no. it's like twelve yeah. bucks. I don't, no, care. Gary, I, don't care. I don't care. I don't care. He um, cashed, like, Gary. I'm rolling, you, you, Gary. I'm rolling, Gary. I'm rolling in the cash. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rolling. <laughs> I'm rolling. <laughs> wait, wait. Did you make like seven hundred bucks, man? Yeah, where, but, your no. I mean, it's. It, oh, it definitely. Um, I there were a yeah, lot of people need, watching you MPO need the money this year because there's Wi-Fi. I, I know. I, I can tell you, re- if, if I caddy for AB and he wins worlds, I'm demanding 26. <laughs> percent If you're not listening, to restoke the fire. If you're listening, that's not true. After y'all brought up the potential holes in my strength of field, I was like, "Dang, this is gonna make me look real dumb when I go to Stat Mando and, and read it." Uh, but Stat Mando's claiming they said, "What event has the strongest field ever, according to Stat Mando? Filter by tier and search by event name for different ways to view the data." So I don't Wait, know. But that doesn't tell you how they find that out, though. I don't yeah. know how they find the data. I'm just saying my, they're claiming it's the field suspicion. ever, not field within that year. Yeah, my suspicion is it's the strongest field ever, but it's within what the field could be. Like, there's no way that they're comparing you. a field from 1990 to Worlds. A- Worlds 2015. Uh, let me just pull that up. Worlds 2015 had a strength of field of 58. Worlds 2023 had a strength of field of... Okay. 96. So let me... So that would tell me that it probably is comparing them to each other. Well, let me tell you For this. Worlds back then to be half as strong as Worlds now, well, that and this feels doesn't, right. This doesn't factor in the bottom half of the field because I believe that's, uh, that's important. But as far as looking at the top end of the field, um, the Copenhagen Open had a strength of field of 18. And it had yeah. 70... And it had 45 players, 1,000 rated up which is almost as much as worlds in 2015 and, and worlds in 2015, you're telling me had a, like a, a incredibly high strength of field. So, that, so the, the top uh-huh. end of the field. Yeah. I don't know. I, but you know, but what's the bottom end of the Copenhagen open? I did. Yeah, like the bottom end's 800 rated players. And that's pretty fair. Well, it's, it's it was an 800 players, 800 rated. My players. question would also be, I just, how I'm many, just saying that, that all, how many all thousand rated players were there in 2015 versus today? Well, right, that's what I'm saying. Rating, that might be how they're calculating ratings also it. suck. So like, why are we talking about ratings? Come on, I just I just debunked. I just debunked rate. No, pick up the 2015 <laughs> field and drop them in the 2023 field. Well, I'm how not, many of those guys are finishing? Well, Brody, the top here's 10? what I said on. Here's what I said on Grip One, two, Though ratings are not perfect, if you look at the top 50 rated players in the world right now, there's a few outliers, but most of them, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Those are the best players. So like, you can use it somewhat as a judge. But you can't really take a 10, 50 rated. You guys are literally just talking about thousand rated players. Like you, there are people that are thousand rated because they play. Well, Sam was because they play their local tournaments. There are some there are thousand. Yeah, there are some players. We're not talking about the top people. We're talking about these thousand rated people. I'm just saying, here's my question. If you pull that field from 2015 and you drop it in the field right now, how many of those guys are getting consistent top tens? We'll never know. (laughs) Well, well, that's, I mean, that's just a fun exercise. Think what about could it. Will Schuster have done without I mean, without a bum shoulder? Calvin, Ricky, Paul—they're all in the field. They've I'll got some know. top tens recently. You, oh, you think <laughs> Calvin in 2015 is getting top tens now? Uh, I mean, Calvin now is getting top tens. I don't know. I yeah, don't know. he's probably the same exact player. Hunter, good I call. Don't, I don't know. Good that argument. Calvin Heimberg. Hey, hey, good argument major at like 17. I don't know. I mean, that's a tough yeah, one to Calvin, argue. Against. I, I would I would argue that. Calvin would say that he wasn't that good at 17 years old. I would throw I that out. I don't think I knew what Calvin Heimberg was. At, at, at he might even play disc golf at 17. He was I don't in know. Worlds. I don't know. He was in Worlds 2015. That's yeah, all I, I, like, I He was I there. I got him want to see what Calvin looked like at that age. He was age. over 1,000 rated if we want to go ratings. <laughs> I, no, yeah, I believe I definitely it. definitely want to go ratings, please. I believe it. Um, <laughs> all right. Next next topic. Brody's favorite topic. He loves Pro Tour finance topics. Oh, um, gosh. Via Reddit, That's we learned here? that the Pro Tour had another round of layoffs recently, this time axing staff related to the Tournament Central show. Is it time to hit the panic button yet? Does this move in the middle of the season point to a serious financial crisis? What's the panic level at, boys? Sam, what do you think? So does this move in the middle of the season point to financial crisis? I think you'd be a little silly to say no. 
um, because no organization is going to lay off any sort of personnel mid season and let for, unless there was some sort of financial issue or they thought that they could get away with it and nobody would notice. There wouldn't be an uproar about it, but they laid off a good few people. And it was also the voices of this show of tournament central. And so of course they're going to go to social media about it, especially since it wasn't necessarily done in the best way possible. Not everybody was informed that they were getting laid off. That's kind of a bummer. Now, We have seen this happen. You know, Prodigy did lay off Kevin and Vino. And so I think that it all just circles back around to this idea that disc golf is not in the same place it was three years ago as far as player base, as far as disc sales. The the boom is not here anymore. And some of the changes that a lot of these big organizations made during the boom, um, they're now seeing the repercussions of those and not a ton of them are positive because they threw a lot of money into things that they expected to continue to generate revenue that have not increased their revenue at this point. And so now they're having to co- take a couple steps back, reevaluate where they're at and make changes. And so I just think it's something that's going to happen. It's going to happen more over the next couple of years. I'm not pressing the panic button until I either see purses drop significantly or a major decrease in the amount of coverage that, that the disc golf network is able to provide us. Yeah. Well said, well said, Gary, what do you think? Yeah. I think what makes this really difficult is that we just kind of don't know where they're at financially, like uh, as a whole, you know, what we do know is that there have been some big financial hurdles they've had to overcome in the recent years. Obviously last year's lawsuits with Natalie Ryan uh, dried the bank up quite a bit. The purchase of Jomez cost a decent bit of money and the money they poured into the European tour um, definitely costs a lot. Plus, they continually pump up the uh, the purses by expanding them to make them bigger. Uh, I think that the tournament central was a, was a good add on because having different people intro and outro events is a good thing because it diversifies who we listen to and creates some more um, good objective opinions. But here's the thing that I don't like about all this. And first and foremost is just the delivery method. You know, we're talking we're not talking like 300 employees got laid off. We're talking about uh, you know a handful of people here that all should have been communicated with, I believe, at once. Because, you know, one of our fellow debate night panelists found out via social media two days before he was notified. Um, but even then, it sounded like the notification wasn't the most sincere thing, and that's absolutely not not right. By notifying people separately, I'm surprised they thought that the word wasn't going to get out to people. Uh, but secondly, the big thing, and Sam kind of mentioned this, was that it's happening mid-season, which is really, really weird. It's hard to believe that money is so tight for the, the, the pro tour that they needed to end this so quickly, and it creates another degree of inconsistency for their viewers. This is also really interesting because – the tournament central stuff was listed specifically as a perk for subscription tiers higher than DGN basic. So uh, they're going to be discounting everyone 99 cents a month going forward in the end until uh, we see commentary coverage or purses going down. Like I, like Sam said, no panic buttons being pushed. All right. No panic yet. Um, yeah. I want my 99 cent discount. Um, Brody, what do you think about the financial affairs of the pro tour that you care so deeply about? Well, I think the only good point that was said in the last two was what Gary said at the end of, you know, if they if they said, hey, this is something that we're going to provide and then they're not providing it and people people have already paid year memberships or whatever, something like that. uh, There definitely needs to be maybe some sort of like payback system or something. I don't know exactly what you would do. But um, with that being said. Uh, Sam, wait, Sam, were you, were you hitting the panic button at the beginning and then not hitting it at towards the end of your argument? What was, no, I think it's a little suspicious that they're dropping them in the middle of the season, but I don't think it's time for panic. Yeah. So you and Gary both said like, yeah, why are they dropping him? Well, here, here's the thing, Sam, like if I hired you on to be like my social media guru and you were going to start making posts for me. And I hired you for a year contract. And I told everyone, hey, guys, Sam is going to be making posts for me for a year. And after three months, I see that you're trash. I'm not going to be like, crap, I have to keep him for a year because I don't want. No, I'm just going to say deuces. Like the idea that happened now, like if they're not making money off of this and no one likes the product and they're not seeing anything and they're just paying it, why, why keep paying for the people? To me, I don't think it's like a weird thing that they decided – now to cut it i think they just decided like hey we're gonna give this a go we gave it a they probably kept being like hey let's give it another month let's give it another month and then eventually there's like you know what this is not working cut it 
I, okay, I, so, I don't I don't think it cutting it midseason's weird at all. Okay, so Brody more on the train of a performance based. Okay, it's not working. We're getting yeah, rid of no it. No one's watching this. That's that's a valid argument, Hunter. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, um, I definitely think the only thing that I disagree with Brody on that point is that the term layoffs were used, and layoffs typically indicate that's a different than a, who firing. used that term. Corey Merrill on Reddit who said okay, like so he, not was a the part, golf pro he was tour. a part of the first round of layoffs and then this is the second round is how he worded it. But the so pro tour hasn't made a statement. Tour. No, okay. they haven't made a statement. Yeah. Regardless, I agree it's not time to panic yet. I think there's a few things to think through here. As Sam said, as long as tournaments are happening, payouts are at least matching the year before, coverage is consistent, why would we panic? Everything that matters the most the Pro Tour is happening. Another thing to think through the PDGA and manufacturers tend to be pretty cash rich within disc golf. And it's pretty crucial to the pro tours existence for their success in a lot of areas for the PDGA from a marketing standpoint, it helps amateurs feel like, Hey, I want to play tournaments too, and give them something to aim for manufacturers. They tie their names and pretty much all their marketing budget into players that need somewhere to play. So if this was panic time, unfortunately, I think the pro tours got a few people to, to reach out to of like, Hey, uh, can you really do some more marketing or something? We need a little bit more money. Now, the decision to do this mid-season is definitely an interesting one, as a lot of people have talked about. Most likely, I would say it is a matter of we need to cost cut costs just to make sure we can set ourselves up for success 2025 and beyond. But to Brody's point, the DGN did just push a survey to pretty much all DGN subscribers a little bit ago. Um, and I wonder if one of the benefits that everyone was like, hey, we don't care about is Tournament Central. And if they were like, Look, not only is no one talking about this on social media, everyone just told us in our survey they ranked at number five. Why are we paying these people? That could also be a very legitimate reasoning here. Very true. The power of the survey cannot be underestimated. Guys, hey, shout out we, the survey. If you haven't was, taken the survey, go to Ulti World. Is it Ulti World? Different survey, but yes, also do this. Yeah, no. Is it is it Ulti World? Discgolfsurvey.com. It is Ulti World. Yeah. Go go take the survey. Tell them Foundation Disc Golf sent you. I we, think we, we should all be that. like applauding the disc golf pro tour because everyone's saying no one cares about tournament central. And they immediately are like deuces versus everyone saying no one cares about the stupid PDGA magazine. Stop making it. And they continue to make it every year. Well, we also don't that know was on the survey. <laughs> well, well the, the thing is, is uh, if they're going to cut off, cut off an arm because it's not profitable, I'm cool with that. It's just the method with which they communicate. Oh, I'm not that, disagreeing yeah, with you that's, there. That's, that's the big thing. Yeah. But I agree. If a, if a bit part of the business isn't working well, then you, you got to yeah. cut it off. I mean, you got to remember too. Most of the people that are working for the Disc Golf Pro Tour are disc golfers. Yeah. Well, I mean, and and you know, the, so there's going to be certain things business wise that aren't. That, the end, that aren't yeah. probably done properly. At the uh, at the end of the day, the Pro Tour, you know, it's their job as a young league to to try things, to experiment, and at least, at the very least, they were contracting um, a lot of their presenters for this show. And you know, you might be losing a gig, and that's a bummer. But they weren't mm -hmm. hiring people on full time and then letting them go. That that would have been a worse offense, I think, to to commit to it like that. Um, yeah. All right. We got one more topic for our finals here. This is a fan submitted topic I think is interesting. Um, so talking about the, the idea of water on the disc golf course, it's funny because I think Gary just mentioned earlier, a course that had a few great water carries. A lot of people talk about like water carries are like the, like the bread and butter of a good disc golf hole to a lot of people. It's just, it's it all. And to be fair, not just disc golf golf. A lot of times you see water and you get a little excited. Like, Ooh, there's water on this hole. So here's the question. Would Lake Eureka, uh, would the Lake Eureka course be the most boring course on tour? If it didn't have water, water shots seem to have the most positive feedback of any course design feature. Is there a number of water shots per course? That would be too many. What other features beside water shots are well received in disc golf pro scene? Um, so this fan just wants to know what's the deal with these water shots. I think it's a great topic. Um, Gary, what do you think? I think water brings a lot to a course because it adds a, a really great visual dynamic and it, it brings in short term and long term repercussions with strokes gained and the uh, potential for losing discs for the round or even for the event. I think that Eureka Temp uses the water really well because of where it's located in terms of like hole one being very visually intimidating um, to start your round off with an important shot. You've got the, the walk from 12 down to 13 with the water carry where the, the distance isn't very big deal, but where you land is because some pros don't want to play the left side of that fairway. Um, and you got hole 17 with a stroke separator, but 
if you took that water away, would it be the most boring course? No, I don't think so. Um, would it be less exciting? For sure. Because I think that a lot of what the water does at Temp could be recreated with you know, OB lines and islands can be made without water. Um, but there are tour courses definitely more uh, more boring than Temp without water. I don't think there's a magic number of water carries that courses should or shouldn't have. I think if they're well managed and they're well designed, that's all that really matters. And to address your last question about other features that are well received i'd say anything that doesn't destroy pace of play is well received as long as it makes sense because even though the water itself is great at eureka temp it creates a bad um pace of play issue with 13 17 and 18 because um the there's a nearly five minute walk from hole 13's tee pad around to where you can play it so the other card behind you has to wait for you to walk around dodge 17's tee shots and then you got the fact that hole 13 and 18 share the same tee pad which is a big problem for pace of play issue so water's great as long as you can deal with the pace of play and what feature would be well received good pace of play <laughs> big pace play guy you can tell you spent time with brody it's it really it really rubbed <laughs> off on him um brody what are your thoughts on the, on the water carries you know it is fascinating because someone like reached out to me and was saying uh you know how they can't wait to get to Idlewild because they can't stand all the um, all the uh, man made. Was was it not man made OB? What are they called? Uh, was the word that everyone uses artificial? Artificial OB. And I was like, Have you played Idlewild? Idlewild has tons of artificial OB, like tons of artificial OB. So then they immediately just responded. I stand corrected. I've never played it before. So I, I, I don't think a lot of people have any idea what they're talking about, but I agree with you. Like, obviously if we could build courses like USCGC would actually be one of the coolest looking courses ever. If we could actually put lakes and we could be like, Hey, you know what? On hole nine, that, that sick par four that people are thinking about trying to go for it or lay up. If that all was a lake, that hole of sun would look incredible versus us just throwing over to a field the entire time. And you got to see whether or not you're inside the rocks in the, in the white line. So yes, a hundred percent uh the water is a massive one. Like how many should you do? Like, I, I think I like to have a couple holes where you have to think about it. Like hole 17 would also at USDGC be electric. If all that OB was water and not just behind the basket, if it was all water, that'd be very scary. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think water is a huge thing, and if we could build our own courses, we would see a lot more on it at courses. Big water guys, um, Big water. Hunter. How much water is too much water? Uh, well, I I just thought the first part. I got a good chuckle out of the first the way they worded the initial question of would Lake Eureka be the most boring course if it didn't have water? Because I was like. I mean, would Maple Hill be boring if it didn't have trees? Like, would Pro Call be boring if it didn't have elevation? Like, I don't know. The premise of that part, which is really funny to me, because, um, like, it just makes up a huge part of Lake Eureka and the way they designed it. So, of course, if you took the water away, it changes everything. But water is a great feature in disc golf, mainly because I think it provides a good visual to the OB that a lot of times we lack. Like, if you just have the, the uh, string, like, sure, you can get the same – feel per se i do think water adds a, a side of danger where if i mess up bad i'm not getting that disc back whereas that's mm -hmm. not always true with typical ob so it adds a little bit of fear but i think one of the big things is just the communication through the screen because we all know the feel the fear we felt when we step up to a water hole it's also you don't have to question is that ob is it safe it's like well did it splash wow. there you go wow. Man, brody might have uh, some wow. long, long skin <laughs> sad if something stops <laughs> within 40 wow. feet again but um, water could definitely be overused, especially like considering a lot of times shots over water allow players to throw whatever line they want because there's not trees in the middle of the water. So it does allow like, hey, you can go forehand, yeah. hyzer, backhand, whatever you want because it's a wide open spot. So it can be overused. It also, I think the more it's used, the more use you get to it. And then the less the like all factor it has and also the less fear you have when you step up to it if you're throwing every single shot over the water. Um, but I don't think there's a specific number like once you hit X amount of water shots you've gone too far. Um, I do think another feature that has similar effects and how it makes you feel is elevation, like big drops in elevation, such as like Failure Lake, Beaver Ranch, Top of the World, mm, good answer. Olympus, stuff like that. I think that's one that has similar effects on people. That's a good answer. Um, Sam, wrap it up for us. Pro water or anti water? Um, yeah, definitely pro water. Um, <laughs> everybody drink your water at home. Um, uh, yeah, I do think I agree with Hunter that the question was worded pretty funny. Um, I went on UDISC and did the overview of the entire course for Lake Eureka 
and imagined what it would be like if there just was no water. And even if you line it with OB, it just it looks pretty silly. I think it's it's one of those things you can't really just take out of a course because it's there. The course was made around it for a reason. Um, would it be more boring? Of course it would be. Um, I don't know. I where I disagree is where I do, I don't know that there is a number of water shots per hole or per course that would be too many. I think if you had an 18 hole course that played around a, or in between or around or across a handful of lakes, as long as it's designed really well and the thought uh, the shots aren't all exactly the same, boring just water carries. Water lining OB is a super fun course to play. You know, even if all of your shots are 350 feet and in. I think a course surrounded by water is going to play so much harder than a course even just surrounded by normal OB just because of the fear of losing your disc. Um, to answer the last part of this question of what are other features that go really well in course design, I agree. Anytime you're throwing a huge shot down a hill or off of a cliff, that's a huge bonus on a course. And I personally love any sort of tight gap that then opens up into a big fairway. Um, I think those are great course features. Yeah, I think, and most of you mentioned this, but I think the when it comes to water, the obviously the the biggest thing to remember is like, yeah, you can lose like on a golf course, you lose a golf ball, whatever. But losing a disc, there's a different element there. And I think if you had, you know, a lot of you said, you know, I don't really know when you'd get tired of of water on the course. Well, I think if you had a course that truly put water in the way on every hole or or almost all of them, the only thing that you'd get tired of is losing your favorite discs and the fear of that, and that's what would keep you from going back. To that course yeah. um but yeah no water stuff water stays no. undefeated it's, it stays undefeated yeah. <laughs> yeah um all right let's move on to our final topic here uh we got hunter and gary um gary would you like to go first or second i'll go first okay uh we're going to talk a bit about disc mania and uh what's going on in their business side so do you think this mania is underperforming from a business perspective, considering they have the best player in the world? Got a few good ones. Um, why are other companies able to convert their star power, star power into sales more effectively? Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So I think part of the answer to this question is in the question itself, because disc mania has the best player in the world. And they also have the top European MPO player in tour standings. You sprinkle in players like Kyle Klein and like the rising stars they have, um, like Casey, Casey White, Ella Hansen, and Gavin Babcock, and a few other players. They have a really solid team, which alone in and of itself is a respectable thing from a business move perspective um, from the offseason. And when you look at individual disc sales, I think part of their biggest problem is that their biggest social media pusher is Alden Harris. Um, without his vlogs, I don't know that Gannon really does a lot of social media work because if you look at his YouTube channel, his last two videos were from a month ago, and then the videos before that were from four months ago. If you look at his Instagram page, he doesn't really do a lot of disc promotion of any kind. In fact, his last direct call out for a disc was from June 27th when he said, so glad I have the PD. <laughs> uh, aside from like other people tagging him in their posts, of course. Um, but in the end, you know, the star power that we talk about for other companies, they're linked to legitimate social media minded players. You think of people like Simon and Eagle, um, they push plastic more than anyone because they're just so active on social media. And additionally, some of these companies are having their players get very involved. You know, if you look at this past week with Ledgestone in a Discraft event, AB was at the downtown Peoria Ace Race. He participated in the Play with the Champs exhibition. He had a disc release. He participated in multiple signing events. They had him everywhere, and everyone showed up to see him and buy his discs. I mean, has Gannon done these things at Disc Mania events? I'm not so sure. And I, I also think it doesn't always help that a lot of Disc Mania lovers really love the old Disc Mania stuff that just isn't available anymore. And maybe some of them followed Simon and Eagle away to, to MVP. The mystery boxes, to me, uh, seem to be pretty successful, and I really like the idea of the collective ability of the stones i thought that was a cool idea but ultimately I, I think one year into the gannon deal is too early to judge what underperforming is because only this mania understands what they needed to be successful and it might have mean breaking even for one year so you can't argue that the best player in this sport right now so what they do with that will time will tell okay yeah good points all around hunter what do you have yeah i definitely hold the opinion i'm a focus solely on on gannon really for this argument uh, but i think that you can throw most players into this but uh, i hold the opinion that if gannon burr had went pretty much to any other major company with the season he's having they'd be having an easier time converting his performance to sales but i think that that disc problem here actually lies more within their brand identity more than anything 
um, their diehard fans got disbanded a few years ago when they went through the split with Innova, and we still haven't seen the full original line make a resurgence. Uh, not to mention that it's not the ones that have aren't in the plastic that everyone fell in love with and people love. Their story of their brand is just harder to sell than to co- than about companies who've been doing this since the 80s or since whenever in the same plastic you know and love for years and years. In addition to that, we've even seen recent struggles of them trying to figure out their own identity, most notably with the uh, decisions regarding the evolution line. We just saw this come out. The guy in the video seemed like he didn't believe or understand half of what he was saying about why the evolution molds were getting discontinued and that the evolution line is now the intro to Discmania and like... He was going on all these different tangents and down all these different roads that I was confused and he looked just as confused as me. I think that Gannon, Nicholas, Kyle, and the Vlog Squad and Ella and all of them are honestly probably the reason that Discmania's current sales aren't worse than they might be if it wasn't for them. One big thing that I think they should really focus on and lean into if they want to recapture some of their uh, market share, especially with how hot Gannon is right now and some of their other players, is they got to get their MSRP down. The big problem here too is C-Line, Champ Plastic, right? comes in around $20 basically everywhere where it's really tough when you have actual champ plastic and Z plastic coming in like four to $5 cheaper per disc. And that's plastic people have known and loved for years. And not to mention, you now have uh, Simon and Eagle going to MVP where they're selling at a competitive price point, but with a like scientific gyro flair to it. So it's like, this is why you're paying us 20 bucks versus pay us $20 for a new C line that you don't know on not all the molds you used to be able to get. I think it's the story that's holding them back. Not Gannon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I haven't, I haven't heard of the, the what's the evolution thing you're referring to. They are moving the tactic into possibly into like approach disc. They're canceling the mutant. They're moving the splice into like an FD4, maybe. They're keeping the essence. They're keeping the. They want the evolution line to be like. They want their evolution line to just be beginner friendly discs for mm. whatever reason. Mm. But mm. they don't see. Like it seems like it was too confusing for people. So they're only getting rid of part of it because they think that'll solve it somehow. That doesn't Hunter, make sense. Hunter, who did a better job of understanding the guy from Dismania or the guy that created ratings? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't know. I think they're both who's, sitting who's, there. And if you, if you poke better? both of them, I'm going to say the guy from Dismania because I don't think it was his idea. I think he was the person who was just told, hey, okay. here's what we're doing. Mm, you sit down mouthpiece. and explain it. Yeah. And he's like, I don't, I don't know. Like, look, the tactics is you might see it again. It might be the P4. I don't know what's going to happen to it. You might see it. You might not. And then they're like, oh, the, the, the essence is staying. You like the essence, right? Uh, but the instinct's gone. It might be the FD1. But if it's the FD1, we're going to have to move. I was like, bro, like, what is this? What am I watching right now? He, they should just sell all the molds. They should just sell them. Yeah. The, yeah. I, I think, um, honestly, probably the one of the just most – it's very black and white, but probably the easiest things what Hunter mentioned is is the cost, right? Like when you are trying to, because you know you mentioned you've got the the disbanded fan base, and you're not even using the same plastic anymore, so you're basically working from scratch. You might get some trilogy people to hop over, but when you're doing that, um, you know, I, I remember when I was first getting into disc golf and and really shopping around the market, and if I wanted to try MVP, for example, they were one of the newest people in the game when I was getting into disc golf and it hurt to add that disc to the cart when I knew I could get another one for cheaper. Like it, it's, it's a legitimate factor when you're talking about three, $4, it's like, well, if I, if I didn't get this, I could add on this other baseline disc and, and, you know, have it come at the same price. Um, so I think there is a barrier there. And especially when, you know, they're working uphill. It's, it's weird. Cause this mania, I feel like has really solid marketing at times. You know, Gary mentioned the mystery boxes, incredible marketing campaign, huge success for them. Um, but then, you know, I also Gary mentioned, I think one of the biggest problems is you just have to have players who are committed to social media. I, I have a hard time believing that any disc golfer that is relatively decent and on tour and has a, and somewhat of a personality who puts the time into social media can't you know, two X, three X, four X, their popularity and their sales. It, it, I, fans my only want pushback that. on the social media side is we see Calvin Heimberg who appears in Joe Mez's practice rounds quite a bit, obviously, but we see him moving plastic at a rate that Gannon has yet to even come close to when they oh, both yeah. had a, a similar performance over the last like two years. To be fair though, Calvin mm-hmm. is with Innova. Well, and, yeah, yeah, I was yeah say, but the, that's saying the, that's the more... problem. The problem lies in the company, not in the player. Is my my whole argument? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but there's a there's, I think I think if a player's smart enough to know the company they're playing for, they have a higher burden to to get get out their name. I'm surprised that like Gannon didn't come out and help push his European Open 
like celebratory disc. Like we, I'm, there's nothing from him on that point. It's all disc mania pushing yeah. it. And maybe it's a failure to structure his contract in a way that, that elicits that more, you know, if you are sign a guy, you, you know, and you're dependent on them to move plastic to pay for that contract and you need to structure it in a way that is getting the most out of that. Um, I don't know. There is yeah. one other thing that I think disc mania has an uphill battle against. There's a company that I won't name on uh, this, this, channel that does have old disc mania molds that is selling them in the old end of a plastic for fifteen dollars so Very it's true. like <laughs> why don't i buy a new c-line md3 vibram. for 21.99 when yeah, i can get vibram. a vibram disc you know i was gonna say it but when i get a vibram disc <laughs> for 15 you know like that's, yeah. Spoiler. that's another uphill battle that they're always gonna have to face against it's because true. that's not like in disc golf that's like some hush hush thing that's a uh, people mm -hmm. know that they know it well, I have and, no idea. And we just what we just watched a company in Prodigy sit for a couple years there with just an insanely stacked roster and really not do a ton with it. Um, you know, it's some 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 players just have that itch and to move plastic, and some some don't. It's it's a tricky one. But I, at the I, end, I, I, still, I think that a lot of that lied with the company. <laughs> I think some of it's just some of the plastics is harder to move. No, yeah, no, I, I agree. I was about to say at the end of the day, the plastic is the plastic, and the consumer, if they don't like the plastic, they're not going to throw it. Like that, yeah. that is that is the truth. I think you can overcome a lot of that with a player who's very motivated. But at the end of the day, that might only sell it one time, and then they might not go back to it. You know, it, yeah. the plastic does have to speak for itself. But I think this mini's plastic is good. So I um, love the I love the C line MD three. It's just not the old the MD three of old. You yeah. just have to re rework your brain. It's different yeah. disc. It's different, mm -hmm. but it's it's solid. Um, all right, Gary, you're our winner. What's your favorite disc mania disc? This video is not sponsored. You, you know, it's it's funny. I my bag consists of eleven different manufacturers, wow. <laughs> but but I, I don't think I can name I, eleven. Yeah, I, I put with P one originals, and uh, oh. they're just there's something about them. There's something about them. So these are the, these are the P ones. The Innova made P ones. Or the, the new the, the mystery box like P1 originals. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. I, 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 I it's confusing because they call the new stuff the originals. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, I feel like if if you uh, if you get your hand wet in the rain, they have the same grips. So I just love how how flat and like the grip of them is so nice. There you go. Something nice about this mania. Brody, are you Brody's conducting? doing like some voodoo over Brody? there. I'm just gonna leave people with one story that I think will make everyone smile. Uh, for those that don't watch Tour Life on Tuesday, um. I struggled, and Gary can attest to this. I struggled to find the right disc on hole one. And this goes back to mm. I had a disc in my bag that I knew would be good for it, but I couldn't afford to lose it. So I was continuing to put a disc in my bag that I had never thrown before in hopes that it was the right <laughs> disc. Day then, one, too overstable. Day two, Ezra sabotaged me. Day three, I knew a disc – like I found an old disc in my like uh, uh, backup bag, and I was like, "Oh, this is the right disc." Problem: it was the same colored disc as my really overstable nuke. <laughs> so oh, no. when I got to the hole one, I didn't put two and two together. I kind of forgot that I now have two red nukes, and I was just thinking of the one red nuke that I just put in my bag. I grab it; it lands like two hundred feet in the middle of the lake. Tristan Tanner, a bunch of people saw it happen and was like, what the heck was that? And I was befuddled. I was like, what? I get to hold two. I'm like, all right, this is where I throw my stable red nuke. I go to grab my stable red nuke. It's the <laughs> other red nuke. And I'm like, <laughs> so not only did I mess that shot up, but I also lost like my favorite stable red nuke. So that tells you guys, that is why you put the line, the Sharpie line. If you have yeah. two, line. two of the same color discs, Sharpie line down the middle. You'll never make that mistake. Wow. There you go. That is, yeah, that's true. You don't want to, you don't want to throw your favorite nuke. 200 that story, feet in that story took me back to like 2021 USDGC or whenever it was that we were walking with Brody and he hadn't thrown oh, any of his bag, basically. The teal raptor. <laughs> and he just kept just picking one up. And I'm like, I, I don't know if I would go with that one. Oh, I was like, I think this nuke's pretty stable. And she's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's OB. Oh, that's OB. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, that was a rough one. That a lot of nukes one. all over the place. <laughs> um, all right. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to leave a like below. Also, scan the QR code pop up on the screen here. Uh, oh, big QR oh, big code. Shout out, Silas. Oh, big geez. QR. Um, <laughs> You can also click the link in the description to submit topics. Obviously, we had a fan submitted topic uh, this week. I appreciate getting the submission. It helps me plan the show. Um, so make sure to throw those in there. 
And uh, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. We'll see you again next week. We're approaching Worlds, and surely we're going to have some pretty interesting topics as we get to Worlds and especially afterwards. So make sure to continue tuning into the show, and we'll see you next week. 2015.